Good morning, class. Uh, this is a course uh, known as uh, Principles of uh, Foundation for Principles of Microeconomics and Macroeconomics. So I'm showing you the I'm doing the second half of the semester now, which is focusing on principles of uh, macroeconomics. And so in the first half of, of the semester, you use this textbook for the microeconomics part. Now I'm starting the second half of the semester now, in which we will use this textbook. This is known as principles on macroeconomics. So we will start with uh, chapter four today because chapter three had already been covered in the previous uh, section on microeconomics, which was the one on uh, supply and demand. So uh, as usual, please take note and you know take out your uh, pull out your PowerPoint slides so you can look at it at the same time and take note as well. And when I write on the whiteboard, that's when you want to take uh, major notes. Okay, so without further delay, we're going to get started now with Chapter 4. So in Chapter 4, we're going to deal with a big part of the economy. So I'm going to write this here. Uh, so in macroeconomics, you're dealing with the big pictures of the economies. And some of the things that we do is we study the indicators of economic performance. And of course, uh, some of the things that you study would be GDP. And it stands for gross domestic products, which is what we will cover in chapter four. And so this is a quick uh, summary of what we'll be doing the second half of the semester. And then uh, chapter five will cover inflation, which is also a big topic. And then chapter six we cover the unemployment as well as the labor market. And then chapter seven, we will cover the uh, economic growth, which is uh, basically, um, you talk about GDP per capita, like the standards of living and things like that, chapter seven. And chapter eight, we'll study capital market. We will talk about uh, savings and investment in the capital market. That will be our chapter eight. And then chapter nine, we would uh, deal with the money market. Again, uh, we'll be talking about the supply and demand of money. So you see the previous chapter three is extremely important in the sense that when you study the fundamentals of supply and demand, you could apply it not only to the product market, but also to the uh, labor market and capital market and money market as well. So, and then after that, we have the rest of it is chapter 10, 11, and 12 deal with uh, policy. Uh, fiscal policy and monetary policy, basically. And this is actually our Keynesian model. So that's just a quick overview of what we will cover in the macroeconomic section, which is the second half of the ECN uh, 5030. So please don't forget to get the textbook uh, that I've shown you earlier. The textbook is required uh, because, you know, online class, you really need to have a textbook. Uh, and although you do watch a video of instructors uh, showing you things, but, you know, PowerPoint slides is really not a good substitute for a textbook. So you want to have... Uh, uh, the textbook as well, and if you want details of it. So basically, like I say again, the PowerPoint slides, uh, it's only like a supplement to help you, um, you know, my presentation and your understanding. It's good for review, but for detailed explanation, you might want to go to the textbook. Okay, I'm going to erase this. So I'm going to go to chapter four now. Um, so what we're doing here is uh, chapter four, we're dealing with uh, gross domestic product. Uh, this is a definition for it. It's a market value of the final goods and services produced in a country during a given period. So everything that I underlined there is extremely important. So because uh, we would push that definition for everything that's underlined there when you define gross domestic product. So what it is, is measure how, how many things, what is the value of all the things that you produce in the country. Like for example, USA will produce cowboy boots uh, 
uh, Microsoft Windows 10 software or your um, HP computers. And what about China? What does China produce? You know, in the whole country across all industry. So what we do is we boil it down all to the values of the production in the big country, and then we compare this number across all different nations. So that's how you measure the uh, performance of the economy. So right now, a lot of people say, well, U.S. has been number one in terms of GDP production, although they have been report that say China is catching up. So when you look at this GDP number, you want to be very careful where you get the source from. Okay, so first of all, let's go to the, the first definition, say market value. What is market value? So market value is something that you add up everything. Everything that you produce, the quantities of different goods and services into one measurement. So like I said, um, you know, if you measure Microsoft Windows 10, how many copies do you produce a day? Uh, and then for the whole year. So because you measure it in terms of a calendar year, like from generally the first 2017 to December 31st, uh, 2017. Uh, so the key point here is it must have it must have a market value. For example, let me just give example because the example helps you to understand a little bit better. So if you were to just, uh, you know, for example, like if you, Valentine's Day is coming, you're building a very nice, beautiful bookcase for your girlfriend. Okay, just one example here. And it takes you two months to complete it. So when you finish, you present it to your girlfriend, you know, on Valentine's Day. You say, oh yeah, here in Bala, here's the, the bookcase. And, and by the way, it costs $500. Uh oh, what's the problem? The problem is uh, it's a gift. A gift does not have any market value. So another example, if you have your Uncle Bob come by your house uh, doing plumbing job, um, you know, he's a plumber, so he would do the job for you, spend one hour, and at the end of the service, uh, you, you want to pay him something. You say, oh, no need, you know. And so you might give him like five bucks for, you know, a token. Uh, of appreciation, like, you know, just to get, buy coffee for, uh, and, and there's no receipt being issued. So in that sense, it's not a market value. It's not being captured. So that's what we have to do. And to calculate the market value, let us look at this example here. So in this example, we want to look at how to calculate GDP for Orchard Deer. Orchard Deer is a fictitious uh, country and the total productions uh, in this country, we have three products here, four apples, six banana, and three pairs of shoes. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write down an equation. This is a summation of PIXI. So I is one item all the way to three items. So in this case, you have P1X1 plus P2X2 plus P3X3. So one is your apple, and two is your banana, and three will be a pair of shoes. So X will be the quantity. For example, in this case, you have uh, the price. Uh, P here is the unit price, okay? So in this case, this will be price of apple will be 25 cents, and P2 will be price of banana, which is 50 cents. P3 will be the price of uh, shoes, which is $20. And so X3, all the X's are your quantities. So in this case, the example we look at, we say, oh yeah, so four, pay, uh, four apples, excuse me, six bananas, and then X3 will be uh, three pairs of shoes. So that's what you do. The products of it, you multiply it together. You take the, uh, the unit price of each item, apple, banana, and shoes, and you multiply by each quantity that you consume or produce in a given country. So you got four apples, six bananas, and three pairs of shoes. So when you do that, be very careful. You do the product first, and that's why you put it in parentheses. So it's like this. So when you do all this together, the answer is 64. $64, because the first one you get a dollar here, and the second one you, you get $3, the last one is 60 
So $60 plus $3 plus $1, you get a total of $64. And we also say that more expensive items receive a higher weight than cheaper items. So as you can see, the most expensive item is the pair of shoes, $20. So that one will have a higher weight, probably about, so when we say higher weight, we'll say uh, $60 over $64, which is somewhere around uh, maybe 90%. So that's what it means by that. Okay, next uh, definition that you saw me underline earlier is the word finer, goods and services. What is finer means? Uh, the word finer here as compared to intermediate goods, for example. This is the one that you consume by the ultimate user, the end user, because they're the end products of the production process, therefore they count as part of GDP. For example, if you compare to intermediate goods, uh, well, for example, if you want to buy a computer and you go to Best Buy and buy it, now when you buy a computer, you come home, you want to plug it in and you want it to start running. You do not want to buy parts. Like, oh, yeah, I'm buying a monitor, I'm buying the keyboard, I'm buying the motherboard, I'm buying the CD-ROM drive, I'm buying a uh, power supply, and then you put it together. So no. So when you go to Best Buy, you buy a retail product, it's an end product. You buy a computer, you bring it home, plug it in, you want it to start running. So you're not buying parts and then put it together. So all these parts are considered intermediate goods. So it's just like buying a car. When you go to a car dealership uh, to buy a car, you bring it home, you want to start driving, or you want to drive home from a dealership. You don't want to just say, well, you know, I cannot afford, so I'll buy uh, half the car today. So the two doors, uh, you have two doors installed, the other two doors in the back seat are not installed. You don't want to buy it like that. You want to have everything, engines and transmissions and everything. So intermediate goods is the, the part that uh, you use to to, to, to produce the end product. You know, like I say, all these various parts of the car, various parts of the computer. So when you measure GDP, you want to go for the final goods and services, the end products, not the intermediate one. So it turns out that there are four ways, and I think uh, this is a good one to take note. I mean, right now, Um, methods for computing GDP. So the first one is known as production method. And this is the one that you saw me using the example earlier. Second one is known as value added method, which is the one I'm going to show you next. And then the third one is known as GDP, well, excuse me, expenditure method. And then finally, there is an income method. So we'll talk about this uh, coming up. So let's talk about the value added method. So in the case of value added methods, right, you're counting them part by part. But then when you add up all the parts of uh, the production or different processes along the line from upstream to downstream product, so your final product, the number should be the same as your, uh, the value should be the same. Your, your last item that you produce should be the final goods, the value of the final goods and services. Okay, so let's look at this example. What is value added? For any firm, the market value of, of its product or service minus or subtract the cost of inputs uh, you purchase from other firms. Well, this other firms means a previous process. For example, if you were to produce a loaf of bread, now if you go to Food Lion and buy a loaf of bread, it costs, say, $2. Okay, that's an easy number. However, in order to get to that loaf of bread, there are processes. So you have to go to grain, uh, for example, if it is a wheat bread, you know, you have to uh, begin from grain, which is wheat in this case, and then you make it uh, wheat into flour, and then next uh, you sell it at the retail store, like uh, Food Lion, 
So there are three processes here. So let's look at it very quickly. And here it is, you produce only one loaf of bread. Okay, so in the case of ABC grain, it produces wheat. And so uh, the revenue that they get from this first company, there are three companies here, upstream to downstream. So 50 cents, in other words, uh, if it goes to the next steps, however amount of wheat that's necessary to, uh, to make a manufacture a loaf of bread, we go to the next level, which is general flour, and the revenue that this general flour, this company gets is a dollar twenty. But you have to minus off the cost of the previous production process, which is fifty cents. So a dollar twenty minus fifty cents, you get seventy cents. So in other words, uh, ABC Grain contributes fifty cents towards the production of the loaf of bread, and then the next company, general flour, only contributes like seventy cents. And then the next level down, hot and fresh, is the final retail store, like your food and line, uh, food lion. So what happened here is the revenue is two dollars. That's what they charge the consumer for coming into the store and buying a loaf of bread. So now the remember you have to subtract the cost of producing bread from well the cost of producing the final product from the previous process. How much it cost you? And so in this case. Uh, in the previous process. So now the second company known as General Flower will sell it to Hot and Fresh and they make a dollar twenty out of it. So in other words, uh, the last stage here you have to take two dollars of revenue they get from selling a loaf of bread minus of a dollar twenty, which is how much they have to pay the general flour to produce that loaf of bread. So two dollars minus a dollar twenty, you get eighty cents. And look at this. So if you add up all these three processes, the value added by each process, you add up to be $2, which is exactly the same as your revenue from that last stage of production. So basically, that's, uh, that's an example that's also in your book. You could refer to it uh, for further explanation. So the, the key to this, uh, using this value added method is once again, your final value, $2, has to be the same as the value of that, the revenue gained by that last process company, which is hot and fresh. So uh, next we want to make a definition about what is a capital good. Now when you hear about the word capital, some of you might be thinking about, oh, Washington, D.C., that's the capital of the country. Yes. Now, some of you might think in terms of uh, making investment, because you hear that a lot of uh, banks like to call themselves capital. Uh, well, or credit card company like to use the term capital. So capital good is basically in the economic definition. It, uh, it can be either intermediate good or finer good. So let's look at some of the definition for what is capital good. It's a long-lived long good, which is itself produced, and then used to produce other goods and services. Wow. So in other words, it is a finer good itself, but it is also an intermediate good. And it has to be long-lived. And it's newly produced capital goods are classified as finer goods. Okay, well, let me give you one example. Uh, a tractor, for example. You know how much a tractor would cost? Uh, about $10,000, let's just say. You know, the one that could do a lot of stuff, uh, plowing and harvesting and state-of-the-art uh, technology. Well, okay, 10000 Now, so tractor is considered a capital good because when you first go to farm supply or to buy that tractor, it costs 10000 So it is a fine a good. You bring it home, straight away you could plow your land. But guess what? You could also turn it into a service. You could advertise to your neighbors down your, uh, the street, you know, hey, I am doing a, uh, I'm providing a tractor service. So if you need service, you don't have a tractor, call on me. I will come by and I will plow your land for you for a fee, of course. It's not for free. So you see, you're able to use it as a final good to plow your own land, but you're also able to use it as an intermediate good because uh, it, there it is. Which itself is produced 
So that's a fine or good definition, but it's also used to produce other goods and services. You could also help your neighbor to plow their land or harvest their crops and, and so on. So another example would be like a computer would be considered a capital good because, you know, computer lasts for, well, at least three, five years. And uh, not only you could use it to produce, uh, type your term papers, for example, do all your homework, your online class, but you can also turn it into a service to help other people. You could type term paper for other people, but please do not take an online exam for other people. So that would not be cool. So in that sense, computer is considered capital good. I could think of other examples like a taxi. Yeah, uh, you have to have a vehicle to, to call it a taxi. So that's your final good. When you first got your vehicle, you turn it into a taxi. Can you use a taxi to produce goods and services? Absolutely. So when you fetch passengers from one place to another, you charge them, right? You charge a fee for, you know, uh, traveling from, say, uh, Fayetteville to Longford. So, yeah, that, uh, that fare that you charge, that is the intermediate uh, product definition. There. So, and, and so once again, long live good. So, taxi lasts for a long time because a car lasts for a long time. So, that's the definition for what is a capital good. It has to be long-lasting and it has to be yourself is a final good and then you can also use it to produce other things uh, other goods and services that part qualify as intermediate goods okay so another next uh, definition about this uh, GDP is the period of time so now everything produced within the country USA during a given period of time and so usually it's one calendar years um, and the other thing is, in terms of geography, it has produced within the country, not in Mexico or Canada. For example, you have a lot of Toyota plants. Toyota is a Japanese company, car producer, right? Car manufacturers. Oh yeah, you have a lot of them uh, in USA. So does it count towards USA GDP? Yes, because you're producing them inside the border of USA. It does not go to Japanese GDP, but it goes to USA GDP because you produce them within the geographical line of the USA. Okay, so two other examples here. Electronic component produced in the US by foreign owned companies are counted. Well, that's sort of like the Toyota uh, example I just gave. Now, the next one, electronic component produced in Mexico by American owned companies are not counted. So if you have a HP plant in Mexico, uh, they're producing something. So that goes to Mexico, Mexicans uh, GDP because it's in their land, produced in their land, even though it's owned by American company. So likewise, if you produce, if you have a HP Hewlett package uh, manufactures factories in China, so whatever you produce in China, HP is an American company. It goes to Chinese GDP, not the American GDP, because it produces it right there. And that is, uh, so that's how we define it. So given period, we talk about it already. Usually we count it within uh, calendar years. And there are times that you could see that GDP is being compute, uh, computed as uh, like quarter, you know, first quarter, second quarter, 2017, uh, and then third and fourth quarter loss. 2017, for example. Um, so that's kind of like straightforward, or you could count it as monthly if you want. Now, there are two things that you should pay attention. These two points are very important. Number one, the sale of the used good is not counted. Wow. What does that mean? If you buy a used car for, say, 3,000 bucks, it's not going to count with this year's GDP because it was produced in the year 2000, when the car was first produced. So the sale of the used good is not counted. Just like if you buy a house, you know, the house is 100 years old, and it was counted 100 years ago. So you're not counting it again when you rebuy the car. However, the services, the real estate commissions, 
you know, people who sell you the car, you hire a real estate agent or they charge commission, that part is considered the service rendered in the year that the transaction takes place. Even though it's an old house, even though it's an old car, you still have to take into consideration the real estate commissions as well as the car dealership commissions. So remember the salesman come up to you and sell you the car, they get their commission. That commission is considered the service rendered that year when you buy the car, when you buy the used car. So remember that, these two points are important. Uh, the sales of the used good not counted, but the commissions of the service are counted. Okay, next we want to look at this example very quickly. Uh, let's see, that's number nine. Okay, in this example, we look at the 2010, uh, I think your textbook will have a more up-to-date uh, number year there, but that's okay, we just take this for example. So in this case, you look at consumption, investment, government, uh, and GDP. So we're getting to this part, expenditure method, where you use GDP is C plus I plus G plus N X. And let me show you the next... Uh, Okay, there it is. Now, so this Y here is your GDP. I am skipping a few slides, but I'm gonna go back to them, so don't worry about it. So now we're using the expenditure method to calculate, and that's important when I put stars here, so three stars, five stars, like Hilton Hotels, that means is important. Now, in this chapter, we absolutely want you to learn this expenditure method, which is using this equation. C plus I plus G plus NX. C stands for consumption, expenditure, I's investment, G is your government expenditure or purchases. NX stands for net exports, which basically is export minus import. Okay, now that you have seen the definition, let's go back to our year there. So this is the most recent year. So if you look at that, Consumption consists of uh, three further subcategories, which is uh, durable goods, non-durable goods services. So if you add it up, you got that number there, which is 11 trillions. So because the figure is in billions, so that 11,000 some billions is your 11 trillions. Eh? Investment, you have three categories, business fixed investment, residential investment inventory. So you got these figures here. Uh, which is 2.6 trillion. Government purchases, you got another figure, exports. Uh, the net exports, you get a negative number. The reason for that is because your import is higher than export. So there's your export import. This number is greater than your export. So therefore you have a negative number. So let me write this down for you. Your net export, NX is your net export, is equals to Export minus import. So usually we use X minus M. X as in export and M as in import. So if this number is positive, meaning that export, you export more than import. So you have a trade uh, surplus to some extent. But if you import more than export, M is greater than X, which is like this case here, right? then you have a negative number, so you have a trade uh, deficit. So this is a case of uh, a trade deficit, but we'll get into that later. So right now I want to focus on, so if you add this number together, that C, I, G, and NX, according to that four components here, you got 16.7 trillion, and that is a United States uh, GDP back in 2013. So right now it's about 17 to 18 trillion now if you look up the latest number. So what I want to focus on is the subcategories here. So what are the consumption categories? As you can see, consumption is the biggest number. It's almost like two thirds, 60 to 75 percent goes to that consumption. Durable goods, what is durable goods, what is non-durable goods? So these are the things we talk about next. Okay, here it is. Um, spending by household on goods and services such as food, clothing, and entertainment. 
So consumer durables are goods that uh, last for a long time, like uh, washer dryers, you know. If you walk into your apartment today, the first thing you see is TV, so far, couch. If you walk into the kitchen, you see refrigerator, uh, microwave, uh, stove. If you walk into utility room, you see a washer and dryer. So these are consumer durables. They last a long time. It's uh, your car consumer durables, absolutely. It's computer, your durables, consu uh, cons consumer durables, yes. Consumer non-durables are things that you consume, it's gone. And of course that will be light, food, um, gas, you have to put in gas to drive to school, to drive to work. Uh, what else? Entertainment, you know, you consume it, you watch a movie, it's over, you spend the money. Okay, uh, for some reason, clothing is considered consumer non-durable because they're not considered to last forever. Fashion don't, uh, the, the fashion doesn't last forever. If you look at the fashion in the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000, 2010, they're all different. 2020, uh, and you count services as well. Services would be like haircut, uh, banking services, finance services, car wash. If you walk into a restaurant, you sit down and you consume food, uh, you, you dine at a certain restaurant like Red Lobster or Outback, uh, waiters come and serve you and you give tips, that's called service. So. The waiter services will be included there, the tips here, yeah. and other things as well. Next, we move on to that's consumption. Somehow I miss investment, so I think it's the next slide. Here it is, yeah. So, investment, which is the next one here, you have subcategories as well. Um, that is primarily on capital goods and housing, investment. Something in the future, business fixed investment, residential investment is mostly like apartment housing, you know, that sort of thing. Inventory investment would be like if you sell car, right? You're supposed to sell 1,000 car, but then by year end, you still have not sold that 900. So then 100 uh, units will be considered as inventory left in the warehouse. So we have to take that into consideration. So look at some example in your book. Now business fixed investment will be something that you use for business. For example, you in a given uh, company you work for, usually there's a computer, there's a company car, there's a company phone. Uh, so, you know, company computer, uh, right here, where I'm standing right now. So we got all this fixture, we got the camera, we got the whiteboard, you got the screen, you know. These are all fixture, well, and to some extent, business fixed investment of UNCP. It belongs to the university and it's a fixed investment. So it's this computer right here, the room right here, because other people could rent it for service. Um, important thing to note is investment does not cover stocks and bonds because stocks are prices change every minute on a daily basis, so you cannot capture it, it's dynamic. So for that reason, it's not fair to include stocks. We never did include stocks for any computation of GDP. So that's for I, which is investment, the subcategories. Let's go back to G. G is your government purchases for government expenditure. Um, so you look at all the government, all different levels, like federal government, the state government, North Carolina, for example, local government, all final goods and services. So UNCP, uh, Pembroke, Loring Bird, uh, Lumberton in this area. Um, and it also includes the, the pay, the salaries of state employees. For example, I'm a professor, I'm hired by UNCP, which is a state uh, university. So yes, so whatever I receive as my salary is considered part of the government expenditure fee. Um, so is military spending, the defense, all that, that's also included under the GDP calculation under the categories of government purchases or expenditure. Now there are two things that you need to make a note. That's last two points here. 
Number one, the government purchases that G here does not include transfer payments. What is transfer payment? So I'm going to write down the definition for transfer payment for you. Okay. And you can look this up in the book too. Um, any expenditure from the government, that's my short form for government, to the eligible park person without, that's my short form for without expecting any services in return. So for example, if you're unemployed, you prove yourself to be a bona fide unemployed person, so you receive um, unemployment compensation from the government. So what that means is that uh, that's your transfer payment because uh, you know the government will give it to you because you're eligible. They're not going to ask you to come back and perform community service for 10 hours over the weekend. No such thing. You're eligible for it, so you get it. Scholarship is like that. If you're, if you got high G, GPA, high SAT scores, for example, all those things means you are probably eligible for a good scholarship. And so you get the money from the government or from UNCP without expecting anything in return. Social security, for example, you're over 65 years old, so you get it, you know, because you're over 65. Uh, Medicare, same thing. Medicaid, C-A-I-D. If you're of lower income family and you have small kids, uh, you're eligible for Medicaid. So that's your eligibility, you get it. Uh, so, uh, but without expecting anything in return from your part. So these are some of the examples for transfer payments. Yeah, scholarship. Once again, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, Social Security, um, unemployment compensation. So that's your transfer payment. A and OG does not include that. So bear that in mind. Second thing is does not include interest pay on government debt. How many of you owe IRS money? So if you owe IRS money and you cannot pay, let's say it's 2000 Doesn't seem like a lot, but it seems like a lot too. So. If it's two thousand dollars, you owe IRS. You're not able to pay. They say, "Oh yeah, don't worry. We'll work out a payment plan for you. You could pay a certain amount each month for the next five to ten years, maybe. But we'll charge you interest. So the interest payment that you pay IRS, for example, will not be included in the GDP because oh, that's just how it is. You know, because it's not really." anything that's productive or, you know, it's just uh, interest payment, really. Okay, we talked about that already. Next, uh, I think we see you send this. Um, so that's about it, really, for, I mean, for now. So next time we talk, we would cover the, what is income method. So again, once again, to capture everything we studied so far, what you need to know is uh, there are four methods for computing GDP. You need to know the definitions. Every single thing that on slide one that I underline is important. How do we define GDP? And then there are four methods. We cover production method, which is the straightforward one, P times X. P1, X1 plus P2, X2 plus P3, X3. Remember the example I gave about the apples, about the bananas, about a pair of shoes produced in orchard deal. So that's production method. Very added method, we talk about the buying a loaf of bread for $2. How do you produce it? State by state, from wheat and then to flour, and then finally to the final product, which is called bread, that you get from Food Lion. So finally, well, almost finally, expenditure method is the most important one. So I put five stars here. So this is a Hilton concept. Uh, it's important because uh, you will need to know this equation like the palm of your hand, because that is very important. And then you need to know what is consumption, this component, uh, what are the subcategories, durable goods, non-durable goods, services. What is uh, in the investment component? Remember fixed investment, inventory, residential investment. 
So you need to know the subcategories as well. And then when it comes to government expenditure, everything that the government spent, federal government, state government, local government, uh, it could be a pay to a state employees like me, you know, a professor who work for a state university, uh, and, and defense spending, anything that the government spend for public goods, like government hospital, you know, public schools, public uh, hospital, public park, anything that has public in it, that's government expenditure. Public road, for example. Annex, we talked about it, is your net exports, exports minus import. If the number is positive, that means you export more than import, that's good. But if the number is negative for net export, that means you import more than export. You import more total, total, uh, Trying to remember the example, ponchos from Mexico, then you export cowboy boots and hats to Mexico. So if import is higher than export, then you have a negative uh, net export there. So finally, income methods, uh, we didn't cover it, but we'll cover it in the next, uh, next uh, session. So that's all I have to say for today. Thank you. Done.